Uh, welcome everybody to the 2020 Quarantine Virtual Insights Conference. Uh, my name is Bill McDowell. I am the COO of Accelerate Research. And I'm getting a lot of feedback here. Okay, Let's see how that works. All right, off to a roaring start here. Um, yeah, so Bill McDowell, COO of Accelerant Research. Uh, we are gonna be hosting this conference that you all have graciously agreed to attend. Um, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers, uh, if you haven't seen that already, I uh, definitely encourage you to, to check out the list of those who are gonna be presenting. Uh, it's great. Um, I think in the spirit of you know, conferences, um, we've got, you know, we're gonna try to keep this as, as close to an in-person conference as possible under the circumstances, of course, knowing that you know, here we all are dispersed and trying to navigate this thing as best we can. Um, I'm going to kick us off for just a few minutes, uh, giving what we'll refer to as as our keynote, as it were, or a kickoff for the conference. Um, sorry to disappoint. I know TMRE gives you folks like Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, I think Qualtrics does Oprah and Barack Obama. You're stuck with me, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> so speaking of, uh, you get what you pay for. Obviously, this is a free con conference, so you're stuck. Um, you know, I'm going to go ahead and level set and mention, you know, that Accelerant Research, we're the ones hosting this. We are an insights company. We are not an event planning organization. Um, so, you know, what we've brought together is some great speakers and great topics, but, you know, it's going to lack some of the polish that you might have from your typical research conference. And honestly, we're not going to be really apologetic about that. That's, you know, kind of the I don't know the coolness factor of what we've got going here. Um, you know, I'm going to refer to to some notes that I have in front of me. I'm not looking at a teleprompter, um, and many of our speakers are going to do the same. This thing came together in, you know, just a handful of weeks, um, kind of organically, kind of just, you know, a realization that you know we had internally here at Accelerant that, you know, everyone is going remote. Um, all of the conference, the conferences that we were hoping to and planning to attend were being ca canceled. And, you know, we kind of came up with this idea. We started, you know, reaching out to folks in our network and, and, and speaking with other insights folks. And, you know, the idea started to take shape. Folks started to share with one another. And all of a sudden, what began as, you know, a couple of back-to-back -back webinars we had planned is all the way up to, you know, two chock full days of really good content. Uh, I think we've got over 1,200 uh, insights professionals that have, have registered for this and they're planning on attending. So, you know, it, it's something that we're really excited about. I think we're just sort of taking advantage of, of you know, the, the environment that, that we're up against. Um, again, you know, not an event planning company. You know, you, you get what you pay for, as it were. Um, you know, I, I started off, I told you about kind of where we, how we got here. Um, I'm not gonna spend much time. We're gonna get right into to the speakers. Um, but I did, you know, just wanna go through our lineup just a little bit. So we've got two days, uh, we've got several speakers lined up. Um, I'm just going to scroll through a few of these there. So we've got topics that are ranging, right? We're going from, you know, normal research under normal circumstances, um, all the way up to, you know, some topics that are very relevant to, you know, what we're experiencing right now in the environment that we're all existing in, right? Um, some are going to get a little heavy in nature. Um, we've got a topic tomorrow on the subject of, you know, the job search in this current crazy environment and, you know, displacement that a lot of folks I'm imagining in, in attendance are, are dealing with. Um, but our intent is, 
you know, not to be too heavy. What we want is something that, and we're going to be a bit lighthearted with, with some of our content. Um, that's not to say that we're not all very aware of what's going on in the world today. Um, we're certainly not looking to downplay, but what we do want to do is uh, basically give a distraction for, for research professionals. You know, let's take advantage of the fact that we're, you know, kind of all in this together. Let's you know, find a time that we can come together and, and talk a little bit of shop. Um, you know, because once we finish this, you know, once we get on, on the other end of what's going on right now, um, it's going to be up to us as researchers. We're going to be tasked with, you know, after this, you know, dispersed environment, um, you know, while we're in this dispersed environment, keeping our tools sharp from, from a research standpoint um because you know organizations are going to lean on us and they're going to trust us to be the ones to explain you know consumer mindset and you know in an environment where this guy um came to a ridiculous um popularity yeah we're gonna have to explain uh what's on people's minds and you know what the new norm looks like after after we emerge from all of this um, so I'm going to ha hand off to, to our first presenter in, in just a minute, but first I wanted to take us through very quick ground rules for kind of how we're going to navigate this, this entire conference. Um, you know, and this is sort of to level set us, right? You know, three rules that we're going to live by, right? One, we're at the mercy of tech. Uh, we're using Zoom for this. Some of you are, are accessing via um, a YouTube stream. We've got a couple of different options out there in hopes that you know we can string together a, a kind of uh, as you know consistent as possible platform but everybody and their cousin right now is on a on remote meetings right we're all dispersed and i'm sure you guys have experienced it but the tech craps out on us sometimes and that is just the nature of what we're doing so you know we expect to have you know some glitches we've got presenters who are all you know working from home and trying to access and at the mercy of their own connectivity and grids that are being very strained. Um, so we're recording all sessions. We will be reposting all sessions, but you know, if something goes out, it, it is what it is. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll catch you on, on the, the replay as it were. Um, you know, we're not an in-person uh, uh, conference here, right? Where you can, you know, if you say something, if you make a comment during a presentation that's truly offensive, you run the risk of actually bumping into this person, you know, during some of the meet and greets during the conference. Uh, this is remote in nature. So, you know, we have to try to avoid the trolling. Let's be respectful of one another. Um, our lineup of speakers, I mean, this has come together in a matter of three and a half, four weeks. So the folks that have lined up to do these um, presentations, um, you know, they're bending over backwards. They're doing a great job here. So, you know, give them the respect that they deserve. Uh, if you must make fun of anything, please feel free to you know, grab the, the glare off of my bald head or my southern twang. You know, those, those are within bounds. Uh, presenters, as well as the accelerant staff who are going to be introducing them, are going to be a bit more off limits. Um, rule number three is going to be Again, we're not a, an in-person conference. What we are is remote, and there is a tendency to sit back and, and watch the show. What we would really encourage and what's going to make this conference special is going to be your interaction uh, with the presenters, uh, with other attendees. You know, Zoom, if you're accessing via Zoom, there's a chat function. There's, you know, a Q&A where you can ask questions of, of the presenters. Um, but not everyone is accessing via Zoom. So, you know, to the extent possible, we're encouraging you to go onto Twitter, onto LinkedIn, use the hashtag QVIC2020. And that's how we're going to sort of, you know, simulate networking as best we can. Again, we're not able to shake hands with one another, but we can, you know, at least do so virtually to the extent possible. Um, and as any good moderator would do, I'm going to give us kind of a, a first exercise, as it were. Um, our first speaker is Karen Lee. Uh, she is from Mars Pet Care. And 
pet care, pets, we're all remote. So uh, our first goofy assignment is going to be during and after this presentation, uh, I'm gonna request that you guys get on the LinkedIn, get on the Twitter, share pictures of your uh, furry coworkers. Um, you know, let's have fun with this. Let's, let's, let's enjoy. Um, and with that, I'm going to attempt to hand off, again, this might get a little clunky and apologies if it does, but I'm going to hand off to Karen and let her get the show started. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Karen. As you just heard, I work for Mars Pet Care. Um, I find it very hard to follow Joe Exotic, but I will say that for this presentation, it is the first time I've worn sweatpants at a conference, but I did put on my crazy cat lady shirt. So I am definitely ready <laughs> to give this presentation, whether I'm at home or in front of you. So let me share my screen with you. Hopefully everybody can see that. Um, I know if you have questions during the presentation, as Bill mentioned, you can type them in and he'll um, be watching those and we'll get together after this so that we can um, answer any questions that you might have. So what I'm here today to talk to you about as the crazy cat lady is transforming the pet care category. So here at Mars Pet Care, um, our Shopper Insights team works really hard to um, work on something called shopper-based design, which I'm gonna talk about today. Um, and we're really currently trying to um, transition the pet care space at our major retailers through something that we define as proposition-based shopping. So I'm about to explain what that is for you. But before I get started, I would have to say that my job is super fun. Um, pet care is a really fun category to work in um, because people really want to talk about their pets, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a topic that people will talk to you about all the time. The second I tell someone at a social event that I am a cat researcher, they, they want to show me pictures of their cat. They want to talk about their cat. The same is true for the dog team. So it's a really fun category to work on. So let's level set with a couple cat stats for those individuals that are not cat lovers or may not have a cat in their home. So roughly 33% of American households own a cat. That's a little bit less than dog, which is around 44% of American households, but the cat population in the U.S. is about 86.7 million cats. So that's a lot of domesticated cats that are out there. In fact, it's equal to the human population of California, Texas, and Florida combined. So we are talking to a lot of cat parents. And in those households, you may have heard of crazy cat. I won't use the word ladies, but 24% of cat owners have uh, three plus cats. And the average amount of cats per household is 2.1. So that's a little bit different than dogs. The average number of dogs per household is 1.7. So if you own cats, you're more likely to have two or more cats. Also, crazy cat lady, although said very often, is not necessarily always true. About 35% of our owners are also male. Um, so it's not just ladies out there that are loving the cats, it's also the guys as well. We talked to a lot of guys in our research. And then finally, um, at least in the U.S., 78% of cats are indoor only. So it's really common these days that cats spend the majority of their time in, inside of U.S. households. Compared to dogs, um, dogs, 68% of them are indoor only. So then you also have a percentage of cats that are indoor-outdoor, and then, of course, that are outdoor only. Um, so that's just kind of the level set about the population that we're talking about here in the U.S. Now, as I mentioned before, one of the things we're trying to do at Mars is we're trying to orchestrate new shopper behavior to deliver full price incremental revenue. And it's through a partnership with our retail partners. So obviously all of our FDM partners and also our pet specialty partners as well. Um, shopper based design is all about understanding how shoppers are thinking about the category. And from that, identifying opportunities to get um, shoppers to premiumize, which leads to incremental revenue with our retail partners, right? Um, so I personally handle cat wet and cat dry within our portfolio. 
And one of the interesting things about cat population, it's remained pretty steady over time. So you have a set number of people that have cats in their household, fluctuates a little year over year, but um, a lot of people own cats. And within that portfolio, the majority of them feed dry, right? It's about a 90 plus penetration. So really high within cat owning households. Um, so the opportunity to continue to grow that category lies within premiumization. We're going to talk about premiumization a lot during this presentation. I'm sure in your own categories, if you work in like a CPG function or if you're an insights person that's working with CPG partners, you're going to be talking about premiumization as well. For wet cats, a little bit different. You have roughly a 67% household penetration. So you do have opportunities to grow by getting more people to buy wet, but also the name of the game there is to get the people who currently buy wet to premiumize. So we do that through a process called shopper-based design, as I mentioned before. Um, it's really a, a consistent process that happens over time. It's um, shown visually in a circle here because it, it never ends, right? <laughs> we start on an, at the beginning of the year. We have what we call pencils down moment at the end of the year where we release, re release shopper-based design guidelines to our field teams, um, which we'll talk about in just a second. And then we audit and validate those, and then we improve them for the next year. So it's a never ending process trying to drive category growth with CAT. So one of the things that's really changed over time that we've seen in both CAT and dog is the shopper's decision criteria for changing or deciding what pet food to buy has really changed over time. Um, so if you're familiar with the pet care category, we see a lot of humanization. Um, if you own a pet, you may already be humanizing the food that you buy and not even realizing it. It's very common within our space with pet care. Um, so over time, we've really transitioned from uh, shopping around the basics, like how much am I willing to spend? Uh, what does this package look like? Those things are still really important in the terms of the shopping process, but cat shoppers are also thinking a little bit more in depth about what they're purchasing. Um, in terms of the humanization factor, we'll see in just a second what I mean by that. Um, a lot of shoppers, when it comes to purchasing dog or cat food, are thinking, does this look like something that I would eat myself? And if so, then it's good enough to give to my pet. Or I'm on a keto diet, so I'm thinking about high protein. Maybe my animals should be getting high protein. Different humanization trends like that we see coming up really big within the cat and dog industry. Um, also, we see trends like grain free, meat first, um, a lot of those uh, claims that are on the front of the bag really popping and shoppers paying a lot more attention to them than they used to. Um, they're really more interested in what's inside their pet's food than they ever have been before. And that comes to being more interested in what's, their, what's in their own food as well. So it's a really interesting dynamic between feeding yourself or, or maybe your children and then feeding your furry friends as well. We see a lot of connections there. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what proposition shopping actually means. It's a fancy term that I'm using here, but I'm going to illustrate it in some other categories outside of pet care so that you can kind of get an understanding of what I'm talking about. So the first one is yogurt. <laughs> so as a non-dairy eater, I was unfamiliar with the yogurt category <laughs> before I started investigating proposition shopping. But it's a huge one when it comes to shelving and how things are organized on shelf. So here's a quick picture from a top customer. I won't be calling out retailers in this, but if you're familiar with the industry, you might be able to pick some out. Uh, you can really see how it's segmented. So it has Greek yogurt, which I know has taken off and is huge now. Then it has organic yogurt. Then it has just yogurt. And then at the end, it's hard to see, but it has kids yogurt. So essentially, instead of shelving just by brand or manufacturer or by package, you're breaking the category out by what we would call propositions. And this is an excellent example of that. Here's another one from a top retailer. If you look at pasta sauce, you can see across the middle, kind of like at the um, almost hip level, eye level range, you have all of your white sauces, right? So you're categorizing by different propositions, um, not only just by brand or by price point. Another example that we see in um, a number of different retailers would be deodorant, right? So you're shelving by traditional formats, then you might have all of your sprays together, and then you're gonna also have all of your clinical um, 
clinical grade uh, deodorant shelf together as well. So another example of proposition shopping. And then my last one is everyone's favorite during quarantine, especially if you've seen alcohol sales recently or you've experienced it yourself in your household, you know what I mean? Here's my personal favorite, wine. <laughs> so wine and also beer usually as well is not always uh, shelved specifically by like the winery that it comes from, right? It's shelved by the type of wine that it is. So a little bit more of a proposition shelving versus a traditional shelving where we simply shelve by brand or by price point. So I'm showing you these other category examples first so that when I get to cat food, if you're a little less familiar than myself <laughs> with the category, hopefully you'll understand what I'm talking about. All right, so what are the primary goals of shopper-based design? This entire um, area that our entire team is, is working on and is uh, doing projects on throughout the entire year and rolling out to the field teams, right? The first thing we're looking for is retail partnership. Um, so the whole goal of shopper-based design is to grow the category. Um, not just to grow Mars product, but to grow the category overall. And that's true regardless if you're doing cats, uh, treats, or you're doing dog food, doesn't matter. Our entire um, goal with partnering with retailers is really to seek trust and collaboration from the fact that we are trying to grow the category as a total and not just for Mars specifically. That's a very important part of shopper-based design. The second, um, we're obviously trying to influence the shelf. So uh, we really want to ensure that what the shelf and the planograms look like, again, drive overall category growth. And we are um, constantly working on how we can refine that to help make sure, again, that we're driving premiumization, that we're driving penetration in some categories. And um, in some of our impulse categories like treats, we're also driving that there. And then finally, of course, we're always seeking advisorship, which would result in category captaincy. <laughs> so if you're on the phone and you're familiar with CPG, you know <coughs> what we're talking about, right? Um, this is a little harder for cat, which we'll talk about in just a second, <laughs> but it's definitely something that we're always striving toward. So developing proposition-based shopper-based design. Let's talk about how we got to um, what I'm about to show you, right? How did we start thinking about this? How did this develop? What does it look like within the cat food category? So first we did foundational learning, which always involves a lot of research, right? And then we do testing. Um, so that's, we have um, a center at, we're really lucky at Mars Pet Care. We have something called uh, the Seaboard Lane Insight Center, um, the SLIC, which is where we have our own shopper lab, which I'll show a few pictures of in just a second. And then we do control store testing with retailers. And then at the end of the process, or it's continuous, but at the end of that process, we put it into an audit analysis where we actually go out into real life stores and see how these shopper-based design principles are actually performing in market. So I'm gonna start with um, shopper insights, of course. So the foundation of shopper-based design is all about how the shopper is thinking about the category. And that's something I think that makes us really unique versus other, um, manufacturing partners, right? We're really starting with how the shoppers are thinking about the category, not just how Mars is thinking about the category. And that's an important distinction to make. Okay, so the first thing that I did when we were starting to investigate proposition shopping for cats specifically, we, we had a vendor partner, Directions. Um, they're an awesome partner for the research that we did. Um, we did some foundational learning with them that involves a lot of fo focus groups um, and secondary research, of course. Secondary research to figure out like what are the trends that are happening within the pet care industry. It's really important that we know. Um, a lot of times it comes from pet specialty channels first. So that would be um, retailers that only carry pet products, right? Like your pet smarts or your local pet stores of the world. You see a lot of emerging trends happen there. Um, also comes from going to like the Global Pet Expo and really uh, just making sure that we're keeping up with global trends and what's happening there. We did a number of focus groups with cat parents, as we like to call them, where we um, really do product sorting. So product sorting, whether in qualitatively in focus groups or online quant um, sorting, really uh, is the foundation of shopper-based design because it gets into the mind of the shopper and how they're thinking about the different categories that you're asking them to sort. So let's talk about how they sorted cat main meal, as we like to call it. 
All right, so the first proposition that we discovered is ancestral. Um, so if you have seen, if you watch TV in the last several years, you've probably seen a Blue Wilderness commercial. <laughs> this has the crazy wild cats um, out in the wilderness eating meat, right? This has become a really high protein trend within the pet care space. So that's one of the first propositions that shoppers will sort out from each other. Also, the packaging tends to be really similar. As I mentioned before, it has wild scenes with uh, wild cats and lots of meat involved in that. Uh, Crave is our specific brand that we currently have out in the industry for Ancestral. The second is something we called ingredient transparency. So ingredient transparency is all about wholesome nutrition. Um, so Nutro is our brand that we carry here at Mars. Uh, traditional blue uh, would be another example beyond. Uh, this one's funny to me because it tends to have like fruits and vegetables on the package, which if you're uh, familiar with cats, they're actually obligate carnivores, which means that they don't eat fruit and vegetables, but it doesn't matter because remember, this is a humanization trend. So they're sorting all of these natural products together. Next, we have customized care. So this is more of a science play, right? This is really important in cat. If your cat is throwing out hairballs all over the house, this is the category for you. Um, if they have urinary tract infections, uh, uh, you know, specific health needs, this plays a really big role, specifically in dry cat, because shoppers are really thinking of it as the foundation of the diet. For us, it's IMS, Science Diet, ProPlan, Purina One, those are all big brands that fall in this category. Next is culinary recipes. So this comes up a lot more in wet than it does in dry, specifically for cat. Um, culinary recipes uh, is all about a fancy gourmet eating experience. This is the foodie cat, if you think about it that way, right? It has the, the goblet with the fancy food in it. It's really delivering that experience of taste. Um, and shoppers really see that, that that is a huge role within the wet area. And then finally, we have like the foundation or core um, of the majority of FDM sales, which we would refer to as basic and balanced. So this is getting the cat everything that they need, um, but it's gonna be at a lower price point and it may not have some of the um, uh, meat first claims or the grain free um, claims that you might see other places. So Whiskas is our wet brand for that. Also very popular is like Friskies, Nine Lives, Meow Mix. Again, a lot of people um, currently feed their cat basic and balanced, but the name of the game is to get them to premiumize because that drives category growth. So those are the propositions that we uh, uncovered through all of the sorting exercises that we did with cat shoppers. Next, we did a couple of fun exercises. So if we were in person, I would have you guess these, but unfortunately we're not able to do that. So I'm just gonna tell you. <laughs> so for the first one, we have ancestral. Um, so we had them relate to like, what kind of cat is, is your cat if they're feeding an ancestral diet? Paleo comes up, uh, this was like two years ago. My guess is keto would come up now, right? Cause it's the cool thing. Uh, feral, it's wild, it's on a safari, it's an Alaskan cat. <laughs> so the reason we ask these questions is because it also helps create visuals for like our POP or our like in-store shopper marketing materials, that type of thing. Um, and then we asked shoppers if ancestral was like human food, how would we relate it, right? So it's a steakhouse. It's like a Brazilian steakhouse with the endless meat that they just saw for you. <laughs> it's all about the meat if you're thinking about ancestral. It can also include fish, obviously a very important protein um, within the cat um, portfolio, but it's definitely all about the meat. Next is ingredient transparency. So this is your kitty is zen, yoga kitty, gluten-free, crunchy, your hipster kitty. Um, so the wholesome nutrition proposition. This is the one I talked about earlier with like fruits and vegetables as part of the diet, right? So how this would relate to human food would be like farm to table is what they said. Salads, right? Grab a green, one of my favorites. Uh, going to Whole Foods, Trader Joe's. And that's kind of how they relate it to what they're eating versus what their cat is eating. Next one, customized care. 
So this is if my kitty has special needs. As I mentioned earlier, uh, a huge one in cat is if your cat is having what we like to call um, either litter box issues or back-end performance problems, <laughs> or if they're throwing up hairballs all over the house. Another common complaint with, with, uh, with cat odors. So my cat has special needs. Maybe my cat is sick. Maybe they're overweight. We also know that a large number of pets are actually obese these days. If you don't know, Mars recently decreased their feeding guidelines because um, more pets are actually not getting the amount of exercise that they need. And we're really um, specifically trying to address obesity within pets, right? So we want to premiumize. We don't just want to stuff them full of food. How that would re relate to people food? <laughs> they said it would be like cafeteria food. It would be like vitamins, right? Jenny Craig, Nutrisystem, Vitamin World, that kind of thing. Next, culinary recipes. This is my favorite. If I was a cat, this might be me. The cat is princess, Louis Vuitton, <laughs> bougie, spoiled. It's a diva kitty, right? It's foodie, really enjoying the nutrition that they're getting. And it's all about owner enjoyment too, right? You like to eat good foods. You want to give your cat good food too. We see variety come into play in this, right? Humanization, a lot of times people will buy different brands or will buy different flavors because they'll say like, I don't want my cat or my dog eating the same thing every day. I wouldn't like that. <laughs> and so they introduce some of these um, culinary uh, recipes into their diet. So they would relate that to like a really fancy restaurant. A lot of people said a French restaurant, you know, um, or like eating at the Ritz Carlton, something that they would consider like special. And then finally, basic and balanced, right? So this is all about affordable enjoyment. So this is a huge part of the category, as I said before. This would be like my kitty is, they related it to broke, basic, budget, college student, couch potato, but at the very bottom, it's also really important, happy. <laughs> this tends to have high pal, um, palability, meaning that it tastes really good, so a lot of cats like to eat it. And how they would relate it, I would call it quarantine food right now, if you're anything like me. Um, so it's kind of comfort food, right? So how Americans think about that is like, it's the McDonald's of cat food. Um, you know, maybe it's not the best thing for you to eat mac and cheese or cheeseburgers, but maybe your kids like it, so you feed it to them anyway. Maybe you're stuck at home for months of, at a time, and so you really just want some mac and cheese to make you feel better. <laughs> the same is true for cats, right? And so basic imbalance definitely plays a huge role within that ca this category also. So now that we have the propositions, they've come to life, we um, know how shoppers are thinking about them, we know how they relate to feeding yourself, what comes next, right? So now that we understand what the propositions are, we have two phases that we would go through um, with our retailer partners next. First would be the shopper lab research, and second would be control store testing with um, any of our retail partners. So the picture on the left uh, is our category vision lab that we have at Slick, which is our shopper lab testing facility. As I mentioned before, when I first started at Mars Pet Care, I could not believe the facility that we actually have um, down in Nashville. It's really awesome. Um, it does a great job giving us an opportunity to lay out different planograms and to test them with shoppers. So essentially what I would do next is I would invite um, a quantitative, so hundreds of cat parents to come shop different planograms um, and sets as they're laid out in our facility, right? Which is a really awesome opportunity. Then I would run several hundred shoppers through each of those planograms and I would calculate the basket results for how they performed. Um, and then coming out of that, uh, we'd be able to definitely get a better understanding of the expected difference in sales that we might be able to see um, in terms of recommending one planogram versus another. So for example, the propositions I just showed, how would we want those laid out on the shelf, right? If you look over on the picture on the right, you can see um, an example. So this is actually set up in our uh, slick facility. But you can see here, we're currently leading with ancestral to ingredient transparency, to customized care, to culinary, to basic and balance within our dry cat portfolio. So that would be one of the layouts that we would wanna test, right? After it performs well um, in the shopper lab testing, my next step would be to work with all of our field partners and our field teams do an awesome job. All of our category managers and our uh, 
key account people, really working hard with our counterparts within top retailers to help uh, selling control store tests. Because the next step is really to see, after we take this out of a research environment, how does it perform in real life, right? And so we utilize all the data we collected from the qual research and then from the quant shopper lab testing um, to sell that in in partnership with retailers and then we do control store tests with them which is really exciting right because then we can learn and we can grow and we can continue to um, evolve shopper based design based off how it performs in real life in a um, fdm or spt retailer right and so it's really exciting um, along with the con control store test data of course which is very important we also tend to follow that up with qualitative. So we'll do like qualitative shop alongs with cat shoppers to walk the aisles with them, figure out which elements they like the best, what they notice, that type of thing. Um, also, we can investigate any shopper marketing materials that we might have tied to like propositions in general. Um, and we can kind of get an idea of what the shopper liked, didn't like, and then we can tie that back to the corresponding data of course, that we get coming out of uh, like a point of sale, right? And so it's a really awesome process that allows us to gain both quantitative and qualitative feedback from those cat shoppers to give us an idea of how effective our shopper based design is. Um, everything that we um, test, we grow and learn from, right? So we, we are learning from every single test in every single category that we have going on out there with our retail partners. And it's an awesome opportunity for us to uh, gain the trust of retailers as well, that we're really um, being diligent about growing that category. So what does success look like, um, right? What, what are these shopper-based design results that we're looking for? Uh, so obviously you can guess a, a sales improvement <laughs> is number one thing that we're looking for. But uh, aside from that, there could be other objectives as well, right? Um, so highlighting assortment, right? Allowing shoppers to see the breadth of everything that's available. Uh, no matter what your category is, you're probably familiar with the fact that a lot of shoppers are on autopilot, right? They go out there, um, they maybe don't look around or they only see within um, six feet or whatever window of what they're actually shopping for. And so by setting up the aisle and the shelf a little bit differently than we might have before, uh, we're really looking for an opportunity for shoppers to see assortment that they've never seen before. And we'll ask them questions like, did you notice something new? And it might've been something that's been on the shelf for three years, but it's new to them. And so that's how we're trying to make sure that uh, we're highlighting different assortment. Second, improve shopability. We want shoppers to uh, easily find what they need, right? If my cat's puking hairballs, then a lot of times I'm gonna wanna see all of my hairball or all of my customized care options together in a single place. It makes it easier to shop, it makes it easier to compare, right? And so improving that shopability is also really important. And then I talked about this at the very beginning, but I can't stress enough the name of the game, and it's not just in our category, sure it's in other categories as well, is driving premiumization, right? Uh, specifically, as I mentioned in dry cat, right? Everyone's buying dry cat. Uh, it has a really high household penetration compared to other categories. So in order for us and our retail partners to continue to grow that category, we wanna drive premiumization. And by doing that, you're facilitating trade-up opportunities. Um, so that could be within the category or it could be uh, between categories, right? Uh, so making bigger category baskets, not only by, dry, um, by getting them to drive more premiumization within that category, but maybe it's also to pick up wet and treats in that basket as well, right? Um, my partner, Whitney, on the treat side, always looking for ways for us to partner with wet, right? Because you'll see a lot of planograms have wet and treat shelved together. So we have actually found that our planograms can impact each other. And so it's important that we're staying connected because we're trying to drive premiumization in both of our categories. And we're also try trying to drive that plus one in the basket. So it's important. And then the last thing um, that we do within this process is uh, what we call validation, right? So all of these things are really important, but another really cool thing that has been developed at Mars Pet Care is something that we call an audit. Um, and so really going out into the field and auditing um, top customers, once they implement these shopper-based design principles, um, seeing how it impacts their overall performance, right? So as I mentioned, at the end of every year, we have what we call a pencils down moment 
where we create a document called a category growth solution, which really allows our field teams um, to uh, figure out how they should be recommending that each of their categories are shelved for the next several years. Um, and what that does is it, it gives them time to sell it in within their retailers. And once they sell it in, we track that performance, or if they don't sell it in, we track that performance via this audit. Um, so Trax is a partner of ours where they go out into a, a number of top retailers. So obviously I've blinded the data on here because we're not gonna show everything. <laughs> but I'm sure you can guess who some of the top retailers are. This is an example of scores for my dry cat audit for 2019, right? And in association with the scores, so the scores are based off whatever the shopper based design metrics are. Um, so whatever they were tasked with doing for that year, they're then um, scored off of. And the fun part about the audit is then you can track that back to how those retailers are performing, right? So if you have a retailer that has a very high score in a specific metric, I can then tie that back to sales data to say uh, this grows your category by X, Y, and Z. The velocities are so much higher when you do this shopper based design principle. And so it's just another method of validating that all of that work that we put in on the front end, um, both in research and then in control store tests, is still really performing when it comes to a real life scenario, right? Um, and so we score retailers um, and our retail teams three times a year. So you'll have a base, you'll have a mid-year, and then you'll have an end of year score. And again, for me, my favorite part about the audit is that you can tie it back to actual sales data for these um, retailers. And it really shows the investment that we're putting into developing shopper-based design um, leads to something that's productive for the overall category, right? And that's, that's a key part of shopper-based design um, and ensuring that the things that we're actually recommending to the field are driving that category growth. And so on the left, we see an example. I will not call out the retailer specifically, but this is a retailer that we've partnered with a lot. They're really open to testing. They're awesome to work with. Um, where we actually implemented a full pet section um, test uh, a couple of years ago, two years ago now, um, and we were able to get results, uh, performed extremely well. Um, sales were up in all of the categories for cat and dog. Um, and also they do a lot of fun things in this retailer when it comes to bringing things to life, right? So shopper marketing materials, uh, you can see some fun cat designs, my favorite. Everybody knows cat shoppers. Well, maybe not everybody knows, but I'll tell you, cat shoppers love to see pictures of cats, right? They like fun cat stuff. Uh, they, they like play on uh, cat words. You can see the meow there. They really like yarn balls, which they have on the walls. Um, so it's also kind of fun to make it come to life, right? And this retailer does a great job of that. And so it was an excellent example, even though I won't call out the retailer specifically, of like what a control store test might look like. And of course, their audit scores are really high as well. And all of that um, translates back to high category sales, not only on the cat side, but also on the dog side. And so that's the type of partnership, obviously, that we're seeking out with our retail partners. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the ultimate goal is category captainship. So on the dog side, we do definitely have category captainship. Uh, we own Pedigree, we own Caesar. I like to say on the cat side, sometimes we're underdogs, if you think about it that way. I have roughly 8% share when it comes to dry cat and roughly seven in wet cat. So I won't call out our competitors directly, uh, but we are not the largest manufacturer of cat products. And so I would say uh, one of the ways that we gain trust and partnership from our retailers is by some of the stuff that we're talking about here. Um, all of the stuff that we're doing, as I mentioned before, is not um, selfishly Mars, but is to grow the category. And so shopper-based design is a great way that I found that we can prove on the cat side that we are being brand agnostic and that we're trying to, to work together with them to grow the category. And that's key importance, not only in cat, but also in dog. Um, so be Peter Drucker, um, this uh, quote actually came from our director, Neil likes to use it, and it's really true. He was a business consultant, and if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And that goes back to the CSTs and then also the audit as well. 
it's really important that we're able to measure um, these, these shopper-based design principles. Because if we don't, then we have no real way to tie them back to the fact that they were worth the ROI, number one, and also that they're helping to drive category growth. So it's a really important part of the process. And then we have another part of our team. Uh, so we have some really awesome people on our e-com team as well. Uh, actually, I should call them Omni now. Um, but we also take shopper-based design one step further. So um, I am leading Cat Manual for in-store, but we also have a team that really works on what we call perfect page, which would be like a digital version of shopper-based design. We also have uh, someone on our team who has just developed an Omni shopper-based design as well. Um, so really exciting as retail continues to evolve, shopping continues to evolve. Of course, we want to maintain focus on in-store where there's a lot of pet food sales, but our team is also really working on developing um, digital and Omni shopper-based design as well because it's just as important for our growth. Um, or the future of where we see pet care going, uh, especially right now <laughs> in quarantine times where we've seen a real spike uh, in a number of different categories for online shopping and also for a lot of the um, omni shopping methods. So like think in-store pickup, um, that, that type of thing. And so that team is also working really hard to make sure that we can measure those shopper-based design elements um, in the perfect page as well, and then also in some of our Omni areas. So I will leave you with my personal favorite quote about cats, because it's so true. Dogs have owners and cats have staff. It's really true. Um, <laughs> if you focus a lot on researching the difference between cats and dogs, you will find that that is true every time. Dogs love you no matter what, and people will do anything to get cats to actually love them. So it's a little bit of a different dynamic, but I love working on the cat side of the business where you have to, you have to win their love a little bit more. They're independent creatures, but hopefully this was helpful. Um, as you think about the process for Shopper Insights, either within your organization or within um, people that you're doing research for. Um, it's a unique process to Mars Pet Care, and I think it's something that we're really proud of and um, that we've seen a lot of partnership and growth come out of. So, Bill, <laughs> do you know if there's any questions for me? Hello. Hi. <laughs> uh, yes, there are actually some questions. Oh, I'm excited. <laughs> the DJ on the request line here. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Karen, and this is from Anonymous. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How do you see COVID-19 impacting sales of premium pet food now and six to 12 months out? So obviously this is a hot topic that we're thinking about now. Um, we are doing some COVID research, I will say, within the organization to try and understand it. Um, I know that one of the issues recently has been in stocks. Um, so obviously, uh, a number of our retailers have been struggling to keep pet in stock. And so I think that has impacted sales somewhat with people switching to brands that they've not purchased before. Obviously, in general, we also see a higher percent of sales for premium products online. So I'll be interested to see if that impacts it as well. Um, as far as where it's going to go in the future, I will let you know after we conduct our research. <laughs> I think it's going all over the place. We're looking at it weekly now. And so um, I think once we uh, move out of the pantry loading phase and out of the quarantine phase, then we'll be able to see how it really changes the overall pet care category. Very good. Um, okay, we have another question from Anne. And this is, are there any resources or classes you used to learn shopper-based design? Hmm, nope. Um, there were no resources or classes that we used. Uh, it was developed, I think, by Neil, who is our director uh, within our area um, over uh, process and over time. Um, so no, I think it was internally developed as much as I'm aware. Okay, uh, we got one from Susan, and this is how would this translate to a virtual shelf? Oh, so we have in the past also utilized some virtual research methodology um, to investigate shopper-based design. 
So the simple fact that we have a uh, slick, our shopper lab available to us, I think we would much prefer to do the in-person shopper lab testing, but we have definitely done virtual before. Also, when you think about something like a uh, large pet specialty, um, uh, PetSmart or a Petco, it's really hard to recreate that, right? And so there are different uses for virtual shelf um, when we do the research, uh, definitely for testing out different planograms and doing quantitative shopping exercises. We have utilized that internally for sure. It's cheaper. <laughs> Okay, another question is, are there substantial differences in the way you have, you have to communicate to pet owners internationally? Do those categories you mentioned earlier change? Yes, um, so definitely there are differences between different markets. Also, which propositions are like popular within different markets can really can vary immensely. Um, our team focuses specifically on um, America or US. Uh, so I know that there are complete differences even within our own brand overseas. So if you think about Wet Cat here, Sheba's our biggest wet cat brand. Overseas, it's Whiskas, right? So there can be differences, number one, within our portfolio, but also in what shoppers are looking for globally. Okay. Um, looks like we've got time for maybe one more. And has Mars pivoted on your advertisements to reflect a COVID-19 message similar to other brands? Ooh, so I don't sit in marketing. I haven't seen any changes in our marketing plan from a cat perspective. Um, I know that Mars Pet Care overall has been definitely promoting our involvement in efforts to help with COVID relief, but I haven't seen any changes specifically, at least within cat for my area, um, to, um, I would say, capitalize on COVID or anything like that. Okay. And where are we at time-wise? I guess we got time for one more. We <laughs> We're making the rules up as we go. Our so. technology worked too, Bill. We're doing good. <laughs> right, so, you know, forget all my warnings and, and doomsday uh, up front. Uh, now the expectation bar is through the roof. <laughs> yeah. But you're officially off the hook now, Karen. If, if you know, this thing falls on its face, it's no longer <laughs> your fault. Um, congrats. <laughs> okay, we've got one more question. As an insights professional, I'd love your opinion on whether consumer slash shopper research on category and merchandising should be on hold during these times. Yeah, so we've had a lot of discussions internally. I definitely think some things need to put on hold because it's not a normal time to investigate shopper behavior. Again, the research that we're running right now is all COVID related. Like we really wanna see what's happening with people pantry loading. From a CMI marketing insights perspective, are people feeding more? Are they feeding less? Like what are their attitudes about what's happening? So. We're, and, and definitely for shopping, <laughs> we have put on hold all of our shopper research unless it's COVID related, right? So obviously that research is trying to figure out what's going on, how's it gonna change shopping for pet care in the future, those types of things category wise, um, et cetera. But as far as our standard shopper based design research, we are not doing any of that. Um, I was supposed to have some dry cat research uh, for shopper-based design that was going to happen, and that's been on, put on hold. Um, we're probably not doing it till fall even, because we want to make sure that people go back to normal, assuming that they do go back to normal, um, but I don't think that it's a great time to specifically do any type of shopper research unless it's, it's trying to investigate what's happening with COVID. It's going to be it's going to throw off your, your, your sample. And also uh, the same with control store tests, right? We have a couple of control store tests running. We're going to have to figure out what to do with the data uh, that's happening right now, because it's, it's not going to be able to be compared to last year or um, control versus test. And so I think it's something research professionals should definitely keep in mind. Yeah. It's a question that we're getting from essentially all of our clients. Um, yeah what to do these days and the answer as with everything in research is it depends um yeah. there are certain categories where yeah full steam ahead um 
especially with you know bigger ticket purchases or asking about experiences that you know individuals had in the past mm -hmm. um something like retail or shopper yeesh. um and it's it's discouraging to a certain extent because you know participants are sitting at home and really engaged from a participation yeah. obviously they're not coming in for focus groups but you know, if you can get them for online surveys for for you know qualitative webcam i mean like we're doing right now mm -hmm. it's great but again it's that it's that balancing act right yeah just be careful of your topic i would say right yep. I, mean, I don't want to dissuade you from doing some research with bill because i would never do that <laughs> but <laughs> you might want to make sure that it's uh it's a good time to do it like our CMI team was also supposed to be doing some like feeding diaries right now. And we can't do that because behavior is not normal, right? Um, I'm home all day with Pickle and Sadie, my two dogs, and they're, they're getting fat just like me because I'm feeding them all day, right? And so it wouldn't be representative of what's usually happening in the household. So I think you just want to make sure that you're conscious of that. Indeed. Uh, advice that we can all follow. <laughs> Okay, so 11.55. So in the spirit of, you know, parallel to in-person conference, let's take five. Let's, you know, hit the restroom, go, go to the coffee line. Um, <laughs> let's thank Karen for, for an awesome presentation. Um, she and all of our presenters are, have agreed to, to stick around as much as possible and, you know, engage with and, and you know, take part in some of the others. Um, so let's take them up on that. Let's let's you know network with them to the extent possible. And uh, and thanks to Karen. I'm going to do the round of applause on behalf of everyone else. <laughs> thanks, uh, Bill. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Way, way to kick us off. Thanks. See you later. Thank you.